is done. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many offices. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. And whither I go, you know. And the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither you go. And how? Can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Good afternoon and welcome and thank you for coming to spend some time in, cel in the celebration of the life of our brother Lionel Williams. Lion Lionel always had a saying which I would try to quote or paraphrase. He always said, um, he, he would always state that the most useful asset of a person is not a head full of knowledge, but a heart full of love, ears ready to listen, and hands willing to help. And that is something that I think all of us should take with us. Let us get started again by turning to our leaflet and turning to the hymn, Let All Things Now Live In. Shut down, 
our, have our opening prayer by Mr. Prince Sealy. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the life of Lionel Williams. And we thank you for the opportunity you gave us to spend some time with him, to get to know him, to get to love him. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that though we mourn, we know that you can comfort us because you are the God of comfort. We also thank you, Heavenly Father, for the understanding that this is not the end, but there is a resurrection. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son that makes this possible. We ask now that you would comfort us as we, Heavenly Father, are here, that you would give us, though we mourn uh, joy in our hearts and thanksgiving in our hearts, that, Heavenly Father, we can praise you and that we can remember the good times that we had with Lano. So we put this service into your hand, ask you to direct all things for those who are online. We ask, Heavenly Father, that the broadcast will go through smoothly and that all of us will be able to participate in what happens here. Thank you, and we praise you, asking you all things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Right now we'll have the well, we have two eulogies in the scripture reading. The first eulogy will be given by, by Melvin Scanterbury, and he'll be reading on the behalf of Miss Valerie Bannister Williams. The second eulogy will be given by Mr. Vasco Graves, and then the scripture reading, which will be done by Mr. Leroy Moore. Before I begin this tribute to Lionel, let me, on behalf of Valerie, his wife, and his entire family, thank all of you for coming. Your presence is greatly appreciated. Lionel was born on the 21st of November, 1946, to Estelle Jones Dean and Ernest Cadogan. He was the younger of two boys, Fred being the older. Lionel worked in the parts department of Courtesy Garage until his retirement. His colleagues referred to him as Willie. He was a very easy person to get along with. In 2002, Lionel met Valerie. They were married a year later. Although he had no children, this union provided him with the opportunity of becoming stepdad to two young men, Justin and James. Their relationship was a good one. Unfortunately, James passed away a month before Lionel. Lionel had a kind heart and would often help others in need. He spent time before and after his retirement in Canada with his wife. Valerie, on the other hand, would return home every year to spend time with him. However, 2020 was the last time they got together. COVID plus health challenges on both sides prevented any further visits. They, however, communicated often via WhatsApp. They also prayed together using this medium. Lionel loved his wife and was not ashamed or afraid to show it. He knew that Valerie also loved him. At one of her visits home, she attended her aunt's funeral in St. John. She went ahead, leaving Lionel to meet her there in the afternoon. When he alighted from the car and saw her in the distance, his first words were, I see my wife, I see my wife. He was like a five-year-old with a new toy. Boy, was he excited. 
That same day, Lionel returned home, leaving Valerie to follow. She caught the last bus from town to St. David's. I was told that Lionel had turned on every light in the house just to help her find her way home, saying she was not too familiar with the area at night. On reaching home, she was greeted with the biggest, hardest hug ever. Lionel had poured all his emotions into that embrace. He was so happy and relieved to have her home safe. Lionel was a member of the Church of God Worldwide Association. He was about to be baptized, but became ill and passed away before he could be baptized. As a Christian, he read his Bible, did his devotions, and prayed daily. His favorite Bible, Bible verse was from Psalm 30, the latter part of verse 5. It reads, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Abraham Lincoln said, and I quote, In the end, it's not the years in your life that come. It's the life in your years, quote ends. Farewell, I know. Until the resurrection, rest in peace. Val will always love you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a tribute to Lionel Williams, known to all of us as Willie, a brother, a friend, and truly family. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8 says, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love, a time to hate a time of war and a time of peace. I first met Willie in November of 1995, when he first came to work at Courtesy Garage, having come over from TMR Sales. There he was, a short man in statue, but was like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> there was something about Willie that drew you to him. He was very approachable and was always willing to lend a helping hand. I believe that it was his love for God that gave him, you know, that gave him that spirit. He was very active in his brother's church and he would always invite me to their harvest to hear him sing Bay City Choir. I, in turn, would also invite him to my church harvest and there a friendship and a bond was formed. For many years, Willie would spend Christmas with me and my family and a few other friends. And this we always looked forward to, and this was at Christmas time. One Saturday afternoon in 2022, Willie and I worked. And while leaving, I asked him, Willie, you want to go with me to St. John, you know, for a drive? I will bring you back home. And I will bring you back home, yes. And I was going there to collect an item from my family to take home to my sister Annette, who was visiting from Canada. Willie said, sure, man. And we settled on our journey. When we got there, my cousin Valerie was there, visiting from Canada as well. And when she heard that Annette was here, she had not seen her for quite a few years, so she said she would come and go to St. Lucy with me for the drive. And she 
you know, we're kind of go to St. Lucie for the drive and also to see the rest of the family there. On reaching St. Lucie, and it said she would go back with me to St. John to see the others there. Well, the car was now full. Me and Anna in the front seat, and Willie and the Val in the back. He, well, we made a stop at St. Andrew, that is for Anna to see a former co-worker. And while in the car, you know, when we got back, funny thing, Willie and Val hit him one another with a pillow, which I had in the back seat. So when Annette got back, she remarked, love is in the air. And there it was, history in the making. On August 23rd, 2003, Willie got married to Val in Canada. Willie and Val, uh, Willie was Val's knight in shining, ar shining armor. And William and uh, Valerie, let me get that right. William was Val's knight in shining armor, and Valerie was William's shining sunshine on a rainy day. The story of William and Val was not to end in this manner, as far as they were concerned. He was to return to uh, he was to, uh, re to go back to Canada to you know reside there, but Willie. Uh, he retired from Courtesy Garage in November 2013, and it was the desire of both to reside in Canada. But as fate would have it, COVID-19 came along and changed everything. None of us knows what the future holds or what plan, you know, there for us. What we have to do is to leave it in God's hand and ask for strength to bear whatever comes our way. Valerie cannot be here this afternoon in person, but she's watching online. And she's not here because she doesn't want to be here. It is because there's certain circumstances beyond her control, and that is why she's not here. But like I said, she is watching online. She just buried her firstborn son I think April the 2nd, I think it was, 2022. And William died the next day on, I think, April 3rd, 2022. This is not meant to be a eulogy, but a tribute to William and to Val. God saw it fit to call Lionel home. He is gone, but certainly will not be forgotten. May he... Give us strength to carry, that is may God give us strength to carry on. Rest in peace, Lionel, my friend, and my family, and to all the co-workers. Everybody wanted to be here, but unfortunately, everybody couldn't be here. So on behalf of my family and the family at Courtesy, we extend, you know, deepest condolences to Val. Rest in peace, my brother, Willie, until we come, because that's a fate that all of us have to you know, follow on. Rest in peace. Bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. The scripture is taken from Revelation 21, verses 1 to 7. Now I, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a low voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. 
And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The ending of the reading. Let's stand to continue the service by turning to all glory, Lord, and honor in your leaflet. have the message by Mr. Osmond Douglas. Thank you very much, Mr. Wesley Holland. Uh, let me say good afternoon to each and every one. And thank you for having come here to pay your, we call it last respects in this part of the, I would say the world. But I must say, before I get into the message, that Mr. Lionel Williams, being an extremely great friend of mine, we used to make fun at each other. And um, I was telling him that I was younger than he is, and he was saying he's younger than I am, he's older than I am. Um, but then when I look now at the, <laughs> the leaflet, I see that I'm older than he is. <laughs> but um, what, a great, what a great gentleman. And um, as you've heard in one of the eulogies that he was to be baptized, actually. He was right on the cusp of the baptism. But what had happened is that Mr. Williams took ill. That doesn't mean that God has not looked favorably on him. And I'm sure that he will be in his kingdom. Are we using God's compass correctly? so that we do not drift off course. That compass is for us. And where are we now? And where is our intended destination in our pilgrimage journey as we head kingdom bound? Have we made the course correction and continuing to do so? My good friend, Mr. Williams, he had made the course correction. And our passage of time is, I would say, 
I don't know, three score and ten. Some of us have gone over three score and ten. And in our endeavor to move on to the way that God wants, it should be based on our following our navigator. And our navigator is Jesus Christ. As he charted the course for us, he went the way, even the way of death. And we know as he rose on that third day that also all of us who die will also have that opportunity to be resurrected. But do we go to God through Jesus Christ on the straight path using the course correction? You know, Peter denied Christ thrice. And what happened? Christ prayed for him helping him to make course correction. And like Peter, who then was determined to live for Christ, as we find that Mr. Williams had also endeavored to live for Christ. And in lieu of doing his own thing and following the worldly habit, Peter set out to change just as Mr. Williams, he set out to change and to grow and sought to do God's work. He sought to grow too in the knowledge of God as Peter did. As he wanted to obviously grow to the measure and the statue of Jesus Christ. As Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13. He stayed clear of Satan's path, asking God for his help, as God gave him that power and that assistance. As he journeyed on Christ's path, onto the journey to the kingdom of God. In other words, he made the course correction. And there will be mountains for us to climb and oceans to cross as the course will be difficult in the days and months ahead of our pilgrimage journey. And that is to the promised land. We know that Israel, on their journey of the wilderness, left Egypt on a high as they rejoiced with the riches of God's salvation from physical slavery. And I would say, I would put a synonymous um, word there, instead of slavery, I would say sin. They move with flocks, they move with jewelry, they move with clothes, etc. As God led them through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And God was leading them and God would also lead us once we make to the course correction from this world way of living and move on to follow Jesus Christ and God himself. However, in Exodus chapter 16, we soon find the entire congregation of the Israelites changing course. You wouldn't believe. There Instead of giving thanks to God, what they did, they complained. They complained against Moses and Aaron, who were God's appointees, and helping them through the wilderness. They wanted, in lieu of proceeding where God wanted them to go, as the Israelites, they wanted to make what we call a U-turn. That is, instead of moving out to the promised land, to go back to Egypt. The question is, are we to, instead of moving towards God's way, want to go back into the world because of the glitz and the glamour that Satan is there having before us? Yes, they want to go back to 
Egypt, that slavery, that sin. And if you have your Bible, you know, when you get home, you can look at verse 3 of that Exodus chapter 16. There we're looking at the world instead of going God's way of life. Back to Egypt. Back to sin. Back to slavery. They were thinking God's way was a difficult path without excitement. You know, that happens to us in our lives as well. Out there in the world, those, oh, glitter, all the glitter, all the glamour. But what happens in the end is not too excited when we finally realize because we end up death. And they were thinking that God's way, as I said, was a difficult path without excitement. And hence the Israelites wanted to make a U-turn. But you know what? God corrected their course, thankfully. Giving them manna from heaven. Although they still complain. And we must always abide in Christ as he is what? The bread, the bread that had come down from heaven. He was the lifesaver. Were they still looking to him? Will we be looking to him? We must not, like the Israelites then, long for the forbidden fruit either. As we see back in the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve. That is, as we would then go to the sinful fruits of the world. They look glamorous. But in the end, that's where death. But thankful to God, it is not the very end of mankind. Though he has sinned, because Jesus Christ came, remember, he died for us. He died for us that we may be able to overcome that hurdle and make that U-turn and dwell with him and the eternal as we see back in Revelation as he would make all things new. No more sin. No more Satan. No more death. That is swallowed up into victory as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us. And we know by the resurrection, the resurrection put the last enemy <laughs> out. Snuff it out. And that's the last enemy is death. That would be no longer. So we must not be like the ancient Israelites. But we must keep our eyes on the navigator. The navigator in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the navigator of life. Not death. And he points the way. You know, in Proverbs 14, verse 12, says what? There's a way which seems right to the man, but the end thereof is what? Death. Death. And Jesus Christ points to the way, though, that we should go. And that is his word. And that word obviously have a lot of life-giving influences. That's the Bible when I say the word. So we are fed. We are to feed on him, his word. And when we say feed on him, we must hunger and thirst for it. And thirst after what we call righteousness, because he is righteous. And so we need to be filled with his word and count on him. And we will never be empty, knowing that he is the life saver. He's also the shepherd. We're talking about course correction, the leadership. The leader charting the right course for us as a shepherd in David so eloquently pointed out back in Psalm 23. And we need to allow him to lead us as we follow him. That is Jesus Christ and God. If we are to move 
on our journey, the course to eternal life. That's what God has for us. No more sickness, no more death, as we say back in Revelation chapter 21. But we will be fed and we will have that life. And if we do, he will direct the path, the way that we should go on as we say we're moving on to eternal life. We all want that. But you know what? It was not just our desire. It was God's desire. I think someone had um, gone somewhere near there in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 when you look at verse 11. What it says is that God has set, note, he has set eternity in our life. What we are thinking in our mind, in our hearts. That's why we don't want to die. God has placed that there. And as Peter disclosed to Jesus, as Jesus Christ was his example, that we should follow in his steps, Jesus Christ's steps. And he will lead us in the path of righteousness, as David indicated in the Psalms. But you know, when we look at Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, we see that the work of righteousness will be peace. And the effect of righteousness will be what? Quietness and also assurance. There's that conviction. It will happen. And we will be forever God's people and we dwell in a rather peaceful habitation. No more problems and difficulties. Secure dwellings. And we'll be in a quiet, resting places. As Isaiah chapter 32 verse 18 indicates. But we know Jesus Christ, as I said, the navigator who helped us to do the course correction. He taught the apostles for three and a half years. And that teaching was, any of us who would have gone through college would know that's a full class degree education. But that full class degree education was not in psychology, was not in one of the other sciences, etc., but it was in righteousness. And the apostles had a classroom instructions too. And their evidence that Jesus Christ doing so in rather a practical way. But it was practical in the application day in and day out to live righteously. They had what we call spiritual concepts. We wouldn't be physical and that new kingdom, that new world. We will be moving from mortal to immortal, mortal to immortality. So no illness, no sickness, or anything like that would ever touch us. And we also have to the instructional manual, the textbook, that course, the Bible, in which we can study daily and live all the way in righteousness once we choose to go by it. So let us read it. Let us read the book. It's not for argument. A lot of us like to argue. I don't know why we like to argue the scriptures. But God said his word is truth. And if it is true, Truth can't be no better. It's truth. <laughs> so why do we want to argue about it? But eventually, in the end of the book, when we come down to Revelation, moving from Genesis down to Revelation, you know what? We win. We win. We become overcomers and overcomers with our course navigator, Jesus Christ.
So daily put into practice the teachings from the book, the Bible. Apply the spiritual concepts of truth, truth of righteousness that Jesus Christ taught his disciples, and not only his disciples, but also us in his word. Put them into our lives, living and practicing the spiritual concepts of righteousness. God's plan went further than resettling in a new land for Israel. For us, it would be the kingdom. And they were to live the righteous way, so do we. Our varying. As they were to teach the righteous knowledge to their children and also apply it. Not only teach it, but apply it. So that they become what? Lights. And also the model to other nations that were around them. And so too we can follow suit. We are to be lights to this dark and dying world. And Moses reminded them as they were to enter that promised land. He had taught them to live by all the statutes, the judgments, and the ordinances which God commanded. I don't have time to go into some of the judgments and the ordinances and the statutes right now. But are we studying daily? Do you know that we are going to be the royal priesthood? And as priests, what they were there to discern? They were to discern between the clean and the unclean. We between the righteous and the unrighteous. Sin and righteousness. And they were to know God's word and to teach it. But not only teach that word, but also they were to live it. They were to live it. They had to carry out the deeds of it. The righteous living. Why? So that they could become a holy people. A holy people unto God. We need to make then a compass check to discover whether we are progressing in our lives. And if we are to do that, we need to fix our eyes on the navigator, Jesus the Christ. And live in the righteous way and holiness unto him. Imparting the training and exercising the spiritual practical habits of the godly knowledge that we will be receiving from his word. But do not become relaxed and complacent and drifting towards the way of the world. But endeavoring, heeding that word as we move kingdom bound in our Christian journey. If we don't do so, we be drifting off course, and we cannot afford to do that. So let us stay closer to the navigator, and that is Jesus Christ, who is life, who is also the bread of life, too. He feeds us. Get into your Bibles. Study it. Carry out what is being stated in it. And I'm sure that we will be heading towards God's kingdom as he has it there, ready for us. As I said, we win because Satan will no longer be traveling behind us because we'll be heading to a holy place, the kingdom of God. Just bow your heads, thank you. You don't have to get up, I say, just bow your heads. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have given us your knowledge and you have made Jesus Christ the example that we can follow. We know, Father, that our lives are not always straight, 
We know, Father, that we do sin at points in time. We fall, but yet Jesus Christ is there to help us, to put us up and carry us as the lamb who has been with David and moving to the safe place of being fed and being cared for and having life. We thank you for the life of Lionel. We know that God, that you had helped him along the way. Yes, he was not as we would want to believe, lost, no way. We know that he fell occasionally, but he did not keep down. He rose, and with your help, God, your spirit, you had helped him to come to want to serve you. And he did so, Father, as best as he can, leaning on you and Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life. We thank you, Father, that you are going, therefore, to have him into your kingdom. And we know, eternal God, is not any of us, but it's all on you, God, to choose who will be in your kingdom. But we know once we follow the course navigator, and don't make any you turn, but move on the straight and the narrow path, we know, God, that we will be there with you and Jesus Christ in your holy kingdom. We thank you. We praise you. And we ask you, Father, as we leave here now, that you'll be with us and you'll carry us safely over to the cemetery. Father, guide us and protect us and be with Valerie and all of the family members and let them to understand, God, that you are going to comfort them. We ask you to comfort them because, Father, you said those who mourn, you will comfort. So, God, we ask as you are the comforter to comfort them in this, their loss. But, Father, uphold us and let us know that there is life. There is life beyond this death. We thank you again and we ask you all in Christ's name and by his authority. Amen. We go over to the cemetery. We will one little change. We will do a last song here. It won't be long now, which will be which is on page five. It won't be long now. Stand please.
at this point, we are going to be committing our dear brother, and I'm going to be using the committal him as I am Sam here, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restored my soul and leads me beside the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can go ahead with him. We are singing, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord in the covering.
we are going to actually ask God to take care of Lionel's spirit at this point in time as we pray. Holy Father, we thank you ever so much for the life of Lionel Williams. We know, Father, that you have been there for him throughout the years. We are asking you now, Father, as we know that a change will come, but we ask at this point in time as he is being committed, that you would take his spirit unto you in safe keeping. And Father, that when your kingdom, Father, will be set up before that eternal God, we know that you will therefore allow him to become part and parcel of your family. We thank you, Father, that he will be moving from mortal now into mortality, Father, when you have done that, and that we all will join with him and we will, with the holy angels as well, and God with Jesus Christ, and we all rejoice in that time when the all will be said and done and you will be starting to make the earth, Father, a new place. We thank you, we praise you, and we honor you. And we ask all of these things in the name and by the authority of the one who make it possible, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We are now going to ask that God's comfort and blessing on the family. Heavenly Father, we know that without Father, you, the family Father, as they grieve, they would not be having any comfort. But we know that you are a God of comfort, and we ask, eternal God, that you will give them the help and the assistance, Father, and the relief. And often knowing too, Father, that you are going to be bring him back to life, Father, and they are going to be seen again, Lionel. We know, Heavenly Father, that you are the great God of love and the great God of mercy. In your mercy, Father, we ask you to look after his family and his wife especially because, Father, she needs it, and all of the other members of the family. We thank you, we praise you, Father, and we ask you now, Father, that you would go with us and you would keep us, Father. And now, Father, for the benediction, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. We're going also to use Jude in the benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.